For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. eBay Motors es tu socio seguro. Con trabajo, piezas nuevas y mucha pasión, transformaste una carrocería oxidada con 100,000 millas en un vehículo totalmente singular. Juegos de frenos, faros, lo que necesites, eBay Motors lo tiene. Con Guaranteed Fit de eBay, te aseguras que la pieza le quede a tu carro a la primera o se te devuelve tu dinero. Y a estos precios, ¿qué más llantas y no dinero? Mantén vivo ese espíritu de ride or die, baby, en eBay Motors. eBayMotors.com. Solo para artículos elegibles se aplican restricciones. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Thursday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Football Giants. Don't worry, folks. We'll be in our studio in a second. We're pre-recording the start of the show so we could talk to one of our yearly guests to talk about draft prospects heading into the NFL draft. He is Bill Rabinowitz, who covers the Ohio State Buckeyes for the Dispatch in Columbus. And, Bill, you've also co-wrote a book with a former Buckeye. Tell us about it. Yeah, I co-wrote a book with Cardell Jones, who I hope, I hope people remember in 2014 led the improbable uh, uh, national championship run for, for Ohio State, former third-string quarterback. And so I was kind of uh, honored and privileged to, to help him with that, to collaborate with him on that. That came out in the fall, and I hope uh, Buckeye fans or even non-Buckeye fans enjoy it. Absolutely. And, Bill, I'm going to start here because this is a little bit of an odd year for Ohio State. Usually we're talking about a handful of first-round guys, a handful of day two guys. I want to know, did you manage to get a cut of whatever NIL deals they were handing out to get all these players to come back and not enter the draft this year? I did not. <clears throat> I did not. Uh, what's funny is Cardale is actually involved in NIL stuff with Ohio State, which means I can't be. It'd be a conflict of interest for me to cover, you know, anything related to Cardale um, because I'm business partners with them. So <laughs> I kind of dodged that one. Uh, yeah, it is a strange year. Obviously, you have one obvious first-round pick and Marvin Harrison Jr. You'll go you know, near the top of the first round. And that is probably going to be the, almost certainly will be the only first round pick Ohio State has. They may not have a second rounder either. And then you talk about guys like Michael Hall Jr., Kate Stover, you know, guys like that that have a chance to, to maybe go in the third round and, and certainly mid rounds. Yeah, so, so so let's start Marvin Harrison Jr. then, Bill. I mean, I would say consensus, top, top pick in the draft, but he's made, odd maybe is the wrong word, but he's made a very confident decision, I'll say. He's chosen not to work out for teams. He didn't really do anything at the Combine. Didn't even talk to the media at the Combine. Much like his dad, he's kind of operating in his own way. Marvin was a different type of guy, too, when he was in the NFL. Uh, so just your thoughts on, you know, what kind of drove his decisions to, to go this direction and what your experience with Marvin was as a guy and a person in, in terms of what NFL teams will be getting from him uh, if they decide to draft him. Yeah, let me start with that. He, he's a wonderful guy. He really is very humble very modest, um, hard worker, very kind of, I mean, it was kind of funny. I, I shadowed him one day last summer because I, I kept hearing from all these Ohio State people, everyone works hard here, and then there's Marvin. And so I thought, okay, what does he do? So I was fortunate enough to be able to shadow him for a day. And my wife, who's not a sports fan, says, uh, who, who are you following his name? Melvin Harrison? You know, and, and so I told <laughs> Marvin that. And, you know, some guys were like, oh, oh, oh. he just thought it was hilarious. You know, I mean, he's, he's, probably there's a perception of him because he skipped the combine stuff and skipped the workout that maybe he's a prima donna and all, he, he's not i think this is a case where he knows and his father knows his father obviously knows how the nfl works that he is the rare player that has leverage most players don't have leverage you know they gotta they gotta it's, it's the dog and pony show they gotta do it marvin harrison jr doesn't all he has to do is say look at the tape you know you, you just, it, it, it speaks for itself and so he thought, why go through the trouble of training for a 40-yard dash 
it's really not going to affect anything. I mean, I'm going to go near the top of the draft. It's probably going to be the first non-quarterback taken, right? That's that's kind of the consensus right now, although I haven't followed the draft all that closely lately. Um, so he figures, you know, why train for something that's really not football related? I'd rather work on football stuff. And Ohio State has the jugs machine. They call it it's a monarch, actually, the more advanced jug machine. They might as well call it the Marvin machine because he's out. he was out there all the time, all the time, just – catching balls, running routes. He's a perfectionist. And, uh, I, you know, the Ohio State's had great receivers, obviously. I mean, you, you know, Garrett Wilson uh, with, with the rival team out there. Uh, Chris Olave has been a great receiver. Michael Thomas has been a great receiver. Kind of the view is here that Marvin Harris Jr. will be the best of, of all of them. All right, Bill. So since he is the unanimous first non-quarterback to be selected in the draft, at least – if it's not in the anonymous, it's 99% of the people think it's going to be. Give me a nitpick. Tell me something that that maybe teams are still trying to check on with him that they're not quite sure about or maybe that they don't like that they would have wanted him to answer to. Boy, that's – boy, you're really digging deep if you have to nitpick. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, he dropped a couple passes last year. There was the play against Michigan early, the interception that Kyle McCord throw that you could say that Marvin Harrison Jr. kind of cut off his route a little bit or it wasn't as aggressive as he could have been on that route. That was a big play in that game early. But that's an anomaly. I mean, he's he's a competitive guy. He's fast. He's got his body. Uh, the best description I've heard about kind of his physical um, traits is from Kevin Wilson, the former offensive coordinator, who said – He's six foot four, but he's got the legs of a six foot receiver. In other words, he's able to get in and out of his cuts like a smaller receiver, but he's got the, the catch radius because he's six four and he's got long arms. So it's the best of both worlds. You know, most tall receivers are lanky and are not real quick coming out of their breaks. He is. And he's just kind of a unique body type. Uh, it's he, he catches everything. He is a good teammate. Um you know, it's really hard to find much fault in his game or, or even his character. And by the way, Bill, not that I care because I think his tape says all it needs to say, but I'm sure you've asked this question and people have asked it there. If Marvin did end up training and run the 40, would he be a sub 4-4 guy? I don't know. I, I think he'd be close. You know, I don't know that speed is his number one attribute. I think it's the route running. I think it's the hands. I think it's the whole package. Uh, he's certainly fast, but – I don't know that that's the thing that you would put at the top of the list for him. I, it'd be fascinating to see whether he would, would run a four, you know, four under a four zero or four forty. But he might, you know. I don't know. I, I just what's clear though is it doesn't matter to him, right? And and he's made that decision, and few players can get away with it. And he didn't talk to the media. We that I was real happy about that because I was that was the main reason I went to the combine, was to, <laughs> and then. And he, there was no announcement that he was not coming beforehand. No. So I wasn't real happy with him. But, but you know, who cares what I think? No, absolutely. I, I guess my only follow-up to that would, would be this. How much was his level of dominance, you think, this year in terms of overall numbers limited by the Ohio State quarterback situation? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, he and Kyle McCord were high school teammates. They're best friends. So there was a chemistry there. And Kyle McCord, he gets kind of a bad rap now. There's a little bit of a revisionist history going on. He was good. You know, he was not a bad quarterback for Ohio State, but he wasn't C.J. Stroud. Right. He wasn't a top of the draft, first round guy. He, he was plenty good, but he wasn't, you know, what Ohio State fans have become spoiled by. I mean, C.J. Stroud is an exceptional, you know, almost a unicorn kind of quarterback. And before that, you had Justin Fields' first-round pick. Before that, Dwayne Haskins' first-round pick. So the standard is so high. You know, but was McCord great? No, he wasn't great. I'm not sure he elevated the play of others around him. I think you could say that Marvin Harrison Jr. elevated his play more than McCord elevated Harrison's play. But it wasn't like Kyle McCord couldn't throw the ball. He made some really nice throws. Uh, I just think that, you know, there's a whole dynamic there about why he left. It's, you know, there's really no need to get into, but – you know, it wasn't like Ohio State showed him the door and said, we don't want you. It, it was it was more than that. Bill, there's a tight end uh, coming out of uh, the Buckeye program, Cade Stover. 
who will be probably one of the early tight ends drafted. And if the Giants don't have Darren Waller coming back, which is still yet to be determined, uh, this guy is more of a receiving tight end who I think could be of some interest. Uh, how do you see his uh, development as he gets into the NFL? Yeah, he had a very interesting career at Ohio State. He was the Ohio Mr. Football uh, out of you know Mansfield, Ohio, which is kind of a smaller city in north central Ohio. Comes to Ohio State. I think originally he was a safety. I can't even remember. He was a safety. He was a linebacker. He was a defensive end at one point. After he was, he bounced around. At one point, he played. Uh, tight, it was a tight end. Then they moved him back to defense in the twenty. In the Rose Bowl against Utah, he played defense. Played linebacker. And then in the off season, they came back to him and said, "You know, we think Ryan Day said I think your best position for the NFL is is tight end. He's a terrific athlete. Um, he's a, a salt of the earth guy in the best way. I mean, he's literally a farmer. I mean, his fa family has a farm." Um, kind of his nickname here is Farmer Grunk. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, you know, a very plain spoken guy. Like I asked him at the combine and we have a good relationship. So I thought, okay, I asked him, I said, you know, what do you, what are teams finding? What are they critiquing in your games? So, what do you think they're critiquing? You know, it's kind of this back and forth we had. And I said, well, you know, everybody misses blocks and, and you miss some blocks. And he goes, and he was, he knew what I was referring to. PFF kind of had him with a fairly low grade as a blocker. And he basically said, PFF could go, you know, blow it. <laughs> yeah, in fact, Bill, yeah, I think he was the only guy that dropped an F-bomb at the podium. He and did. I, I didn't realize it was you that asked that it question. Was question. I was at I was the like, podium for that. And I'm like, like, I, like I love this guy. This is the best answer yeah. I've ever heard. Yeah, uh, he did. Um, my bad took a little dive there. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, he, he's a really, uh, he's just a down-to-earth guy. There's no pretense to him. He says what's on his mind. He's a great teammate. He, he'll play through pain. Um, he, he he probably would have come out. Well, I think he almost definitely would have come out last year, but he got hurt in the Peach Bowl against Georgia in the, in the college football semifinal, uh, injured his back, and, and realized he wouldn't be able to really do any pre-combine workouts and pre-draft workouts and thought, let's, let's come back for another year. Ohio State traditionally is not thrown to their tight end very much. He had the most – he was the, the most prolific catch pest catcher as a tight end, I think, since 1995 for Ohio state. Um, you know, he does need some work on his blocking. I think he would probably tell you that, but he's got the skills to do it. He's got the willingness to do it. It's just a matter of, you know, he bounced around so much in his college career and probably never quite settled in and, and learned the finer nuances of, of the position, at least at the NFL caliber, you know, that, that level. But I think he's a, I think he's going to be a starter in the NFL. I think he'll have a, a, a long career if he's healthy. Uh, he's, you know, catches the ball well. Um, you know, I, I would certainly think he's you get to the third round and you start looking at Kate Stover. You know, it's funny. I, I was going to bring up his media availability to you, Bill, because, you know, Paul mentioned some people think of him as a receiver. Uh, he tested well enough. He catches the ball well. But he's a guy that seems to me with his blue collar background, farmer, stuff like that, that he takes pride in his toughness and his blocking. So I think he has it in him to be a, a pretty prolific two way tight end as he gets more experience at the position as, as a blocker. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I just think it's a matter of getting him more, you know, more reps. Uh, he, you know, he was at Ohio State for, I guess, it was five years. Um, but a lot of that was bouncing around trying to find a find a home positionally. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's uh, let's jump forward here and take a look at the next uh, Buckeye prospect. That's Michael Hall Jr., who I think is interesting, Bill. You know, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're a lot closer to it than I am. I feel like his tenure at Ohio State could be termed as a little bit of a disappointment. People thought he would kind of bounce a little bit more this year and be a little bit more productive. But, boy, I was at Mobile watching him up close at the Senior Bowl. His explosiveness, his ability to get upfield, his athleticism, it just jumps out at you. Maybe we just didn't see it quite enough in games. Give me the the kind of Michael Hall rundown here from what you've seen in his career at Ohio State. Yeah, he, he battled shoulder issues. Uh, so he was kind of in and out of the lineup a lot. The, the I'm going to throw the name out because it's the name that the people associate with him. And it, of course it's way premature and it's not fair to him or the player I'm going to name because nobody is Aaron Donald, but that's kind of the, you know, they kind of called him like Aaron Donald jr. Because he's a smaller guy in terms of physique, but he has a really quick first step and just beats blockers off the ball. Now, again, he's not Aaron Donald, you know, let's let him prove himself as a rookie let alone, you know, become anything close to what Aaron Donald became. But he's that type of player. 
you know, he's not the biggest guy in the world. That's probably going to be an issue for some, for some teams and it has to be the right scheme and he has to be used the right way. But he has a skill set that is very rare that, that burst off the line, off the line of scrimmage. You just can't teach that. I don't care what you do. You just can't teach it. Well, Bill, did the coaching staff ever address his inconsistencies though? Cause I think that's what John was alluding to. There are times when you would say to yourself, well, why isn't he playing at a high level like this all the time? Because the flashes are really good. There's no question yeah. about that. Yeah. I think a lot of that was the shoulder issues he had. I think he, I think it was actually both shoulders. I'm not, I'm not positive about that, but I think that he had issues with both shoulders or at least recurring issues. And so I just don't know that he was ever quite healthy enough to, to do that consistently. Um, I'm assuming that that's all taken care of. He, he said it has been, you know, you never know. I mean, I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't know, but if he's healthy, you know, I don't think he's a three down guy, at least at the start of his career. Cause I think he, you know, he, he probably needs to, to learn his techniques and, and things like that as a, as a smaller defensive tackle, but as situationally, boy, he could be a force. No, I'm with you. His, he's, he's fun to watch, and he was fun watching up close down in Mobile to Senior Bowl. All right, let's stick on defense. Two linebackers, Tommy Eichenberg and Steel Chambers. Different type of guys, right? I feel like Steel is, is, yeah. is more of your mobile guy that can cover, while if you just want a box guy that can tackle against the run on first and second down, then Tommy Eichenberg's kind of your guy, right? Yeah, you nailed it. I mean, you, you know, I can't really add a whole lot to it. Tommy Eichenberg was a two-time captain. He was the uh, unquestioned leader of the defense, and he's a really quiet guy. A very, I was like, whenever we had, you know, okay, we're getting Tommy Eichenberg, we're like, uh, because I mean, a polite guy, a nice guy, smart guy, just didn't, you know, like talking. Um, yeah, Bill, it's it funny was, at the combine. I think I lasted I in this podium about 25 seconds before I'm like, all right, I'm not getting anything out no, of this. But, I'm bailing. <laughs> but at the com, he was the best he's ever been by a lot. Wow. He was, he was, he, I mean, he was actually good. I, I said, we the Ohio State writers who were there, we were talking like, who would have ever thought that the best interview here would be Tommy Eichenberg? And even afterward, he came up to us, you know, came up the podium and came up to us, shook our hands and thanked us, whatever. And he's a, he's a really nice guy. Uh, he just is a very quiet person. Doesn't like doing interviews. Um, you know, Jim Knowles, the Ohio State defensive coordinator, would just joke all the time. And all they would do is grunt. You know, Tommy, let's do it. Tommy, let's do it. You know? <laughs> um so, you know, I think you put it right as a player. I think he as the first and second down linebacker is really good. I'm not sure he's got the speed uh, and the just kind of the quickness, the quick, the quick twitch to be uh, you know, a third down linebacker, although he was a smart player. And, and if you are smart and instinctive and study well, you can make up some of that, you know, raw speed deficiency with knowledge and instincts. And so I'm not going to rule it out, but I, I certainly think the start of his career, he's is more of a first and second down linebacker. You know, Steel Chambers is a converted running back and, you know, kind of on the smaller side, although he has, he has certainly bulked up. Um, it was good this year. You know, I wouldn't say he was great. And he'll have a lot to prove. I'm not sure he'll get drafted. If he does, it'll be in the later rounds, I would expect. But he'll get a shot. You know, he's got speed. He, he'll hit you. Um, and that gives you a chance. Yeah, you know, Bill, I think with the new kickoff rule, this is one guy who's going to benefit. I think he's got a chance to get drafted in the sixth or seventh round because of his ability athletically and the fact that he's got such a high motor and gets after it. Now, he flies around. I saw some some video of him where he just shot after guys like a missile, and he must have had his eyes closed because he missed too many guys. That could get dangerous, but it's that yeah. kind of recklessness and aggressiveness that you want on special teams. Yeah, they switched him to defense in what year was it? It was years blur together. I guess it was, must have been 21. Anyway, it was the year when the defense really struggled. And even as a guy who wasn't a defensive player, they just put him back there out of desperation. He looked different. I mean, he looked like like shot out of a cannon. A little bit like Ryan Shazier did when he was at Ohio State. Um I remember Ryan Shazier as a freshman, I think it was the spring game or something, and he made a hit. I said, who is that? You know, Steel Chambers was a little bit like that because he just went. You know, again, you may be right. I'm not sure he knew where, you know, why he was going there or, you know, or just in the right spot, but he went. And kind of the motto at Ohio State is, is four to six, A to B, which is four to six seconds of maximum effort from point A to point B. That That's Steel Chambers. I mean, 
you know, if you ask him to do, you know, I, well, I don't want to, I don't know. I'm not a football, you know, junkie enough to know uh, about certain things, but, but I, I think that he, because of his speed and because as you said, his willingness to go out there and, and be reckless with his body, he'll have a chance. Last guy I want to touch on on defense, Bill, was Josh Proctor, the safety. Uh, I saw him down at Mobile as well. Long player. I love this length. Ran a four-five-five. 5 pretty good time. Uh, what would fans get from him? Because, you know, you know, it's the safety position, but now there are, like, subgroups. Is he a box safety? Is he a guy that can yeah. cover on the slot safety? Is he a single high safety? Is he a split safety? What, what type of safety was Proctor when he played at Ohio State? Yeah, he was a deep safety at Ohio State. It's a, he's a, it was a, a very interesting – career and that he came in very promising a four-star guy from uh from oklahoma and early on he looked like he'd be a star and then it didn't quite happen well first of all he got he broke his leg against oregon early in 2021 i guess it would have been and so he missed the rest of that year he came back and then in 22 he was the starter against notre dame in, uh, in the opener missed the tackle early and lost his job right then to Lathan ransom Clearly, that was not the first time he had done that. You know, he had done it in practice, obviously, and really never got his job back that year. He, everyone thought, I thought, and I mean, everyone thought that would be the end of Josh Proctor. I said he'd either try to make the NFL or he transfer. He came back for a sixth year and had a really good year and, and said all the right things about, you know, that experience, what he had gone through. It humbled him, made him appreciate football more. He studied more, all that kind of stuff. I thought he had a really good year last year. Uh, I'm surprised that he's not higher on draft boards than he appears to be, because I think that he could be a really good player. Um, you know, he, he missed some tackles. I mean, that's, that is something that he has done. Uh, he was better about that last year. He really he was a, a very good player for them last year. I think maybe the knock is, okay, was, it, was he a one-year guy? He was there six years and he had one year, and I one he was hurt. And the other got benched. So, you know, kind of cross off two of those. But I, if I'm an NFL team and he's available in the sixth or seventh round, I think you could get a steal there. I got to ask you about one guy on offense, Bill, as, I, as uh, we kind of wrap things down here. Uh, Matthew Jones, local kid out of Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn. I, <laughs> there you go, John. I, I, I don't know exactly where his upside is, but since he is an offensive lineman, and Ohio State over the years has usually done pretty well with offensive linemen. I need to ask about his ceiling because he's going to have to pick up his game, obviously, as he gets to this league. But he certainly has some some boxcar type traits that somebody may look at him as a late round prospect. Yeah, I agree. I you know I don't think he's got star potential. I think he'd be a guy that would be at the bottom of the roster. But he, he's versatile. He played guard Ohio State, but he really came in as a center. And they, they actually played him at center in the Cotton Bowl. You know, that was a disaster on all accounts, uh, offensively for Ohio State. I'm about putting it on Matt Jones. But, you know, I don't think that was the showcase that he wanted to have because the offense was so awful in that game. But he can play center and guard. Uh, a, a, a smart guy, uh, quiet, very, again, very quiet guy. Um, you know, I could see him being one of those guys that if you're an NFL team, he's your – you know, seventh or eighth offensive lineman, and you and you have him active on a Sunday because you need flexibility. If somebody needs if the center or a guard gets hurt, you can plug him in. Um, you know, you I don't. I'll be a little bit surprised if he gets drafted, but I wouldn't be shocked. All right, final question, Bill. Give us a very very thumbnail sneak preview of what the 2025 Ohio State draft class might look like with about a dozen guys going back to school that could have been <laughs> like day one or day two picks. Well, we talked today, I think it was about 25 minutes or so. We might be here for about two hours next year. Um, <laughs> they're going to have, and they're, it's the combine next year is going to be insane. Uh, my B partner and I kind of went through the list and, and we figured like anywhere from 15 to 20 players will probably be in Indianapolis. Um you know, if if Jack Sawyer and JT Tumolo out and Emeka Glue, I mean, go down the list. Travion Henderson. Um, you know, it could have been a normal kind of Ohio State draft class this year. Well, they they all came back for the most part, and it's going to be next year. Um, they, they're loaded. Uh, there's, that's I look at the defense and I think, where's the weakness? I don't I don't see one. There are a couple questions, but I don't know about a weakness. 
on offense, I think, you know, is, is Will Howard going to be, he'll be good. Is he going to be great? You know, we'll, we'll find out. Offensive line still has some, some question marks, but I think it'll be better. You look at the rest of the offense and you go, wow, wow. I mean, tight end's a little bit of a question mark because you did lose Cade Stover, but they have talent, they have depth, uh, they have hunger. I mean, you lose three times to Michigan and in Columbus, Ohio, and um, yeah, there's there's hunger. They, they haven't won a championship. All this talent, you think about it, Marvin Harrison Jr. and C.J. Stroud never won a Big Ten championship or beat Michigan. You know, when a ge- essentially a generation – of Ohio State players never tasted defeat against the Wolverines. So right. a lot of these guys came back in part. I'm sure NIL played a role, certainly. But so did the desire to beat Michigan and win a national championship, win the Big Ten and win a national championship. And I think they'll be, you know, number one or number two preseason, probably number two behind George, I would guess. But anything less than, say, a college football playoff semifinal will be – a pretty big disappointment and, you know, and beating Michigan and winning a big 10 championship. So I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Bill. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I'll, I'll put you on the spot real quick. Just like you can give me just a one, one name answer. If you had to guess right now who the first Ohio state player taken in next year's draft will be, who would it be? Oh boy. <laughs> I have to look at the other roster. Um, off the top of my head, I would say JT to a Molo hour, Jack Sawyer, maybe a Mecca Buka. Um, if Caleb Downs were eligible, I would say Caleb Downs. Um, Down, oh, Denzel, you know, Bill, I, I'm not familiar. Downs, uh, uh Caleb is Downs, receiver, where does he play? From, it, it, what? Oh, position for Downs. He's a safety. He's the safety, safety transfer from Alabama. Who was a freshman of the year in the SEC, and after uh, Nick Saban retired, came to Ohio State, transferred to Ohio State. You know, Denzel Burke is is almost certainly going to be a first round pick next year. Uh, I mean, they could have, you know, seven or eight guys that, that are first round possibilities. I mean, it's it's Tyleek Williams, the defensive tackle. Um, I, I mean, it's it's an embarrassment of riches. You know, both <laughs> running backs, Travion Henderson and Quinshaw Junkins. Uh, now, running backs generally go go in the first round, but but that's how talented they are. They they you know at least in the old NFL, they would probably be considered first round picks. So. And then that, that's not even thinking about the guys who might emerge out of nowhere. Right. Um, so yeah. it's they're loaded. Bill, awesome stuff, my friend. We really appreciate you joining us. I think we're going on seven or eight straight years. You've come on and talked about how State prospects with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for the time. We'll talk again next year. Thanks, Sounds Bill. Great. Thank you. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile, and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time, there's Granger. Offering professional grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. That was pre recorded yesterday. John Schmelk, Paul Dettino with you, Big Blue Kickoff Live. We'll maybe try to squeeze in. Uh, we're going to have a little tight here. We've got about two minutes to our next guest. We're going to be joined by Justin Spears, who covers the Arizona football team. We've got a bunch of prospects in there. We'll talk about it at 1 o'clock. But we will try to squeeze in a couple of your calls uh, after we're done with him, and we uh, sign off at 1.30. Go subscribe to the Giants Auto Podcast, everybody. It features really good interviews. The most recent one that just went up there was my chat with Chris Bizignano from Giants Insider. We talk everything Giants. Uh, you go back a little bit earlier than that. We have other good interviews on there, too. I'm trying to think of what the one was earlier in the week, Pierce. We've done so many of them. I don't remember what the <laughs> what the huddle was before Bizignano. I know we have uh, Chad Chad Ryder coming up tomorrow. Um, so make sure you go check out that Giants Huddle podcast. You can find it on the Giants app, giants.com slash podcast, or just search for Giants Huddle on your favorite podcast platform. Same thing for draft season, folks. It's our draft podcast where once a week, Tony Pauline and I do an uh, episode every Wednesday. It went up yesterday, so go check that out. Uh, we go through AFC team needs changes, ideal picks, and the latest news from all the pro days. Oh, Eric Edholm. That was one from earlier in the week okay. uh, on the Giants Huddle podcast as well. Again, if you're on Apple Podcasts, if you leave a positive review for all those podcasts, 
uh, that would really help us out, and we would appreciate it. All right, everybody, 201-939-4513. We'll try to squeeze in a call here if we can. Paul, I know you guys covered some of the rule changes the other day, but there was yeah. one that you wanted to touch on today. Well, the one that allows these head coaches an extra replay review, a third one as long as one of their first two is accurate and is confirmed. Uh, I like that. I think that these coaches, you know, some of them get very, very timid about using a video challenge early in the game because they're so concerned that, well, what if I have one later on in the third or fourth quarter when it's really critical and we're outside the two minutes where the guy upstairs gets the call and then it's it's like, well, they don't use it. And why should you have to get both right to get one back? If the refs screw up one call and you get it right and you challenge it, why shouldn't you get that challenge back? Yeah, I concur with you, John. So if you get at least one of your two calls right, they will give you a third now. And I'm, I, I just, look, I know the argument against it is too many replay challenges slows down the game. That's the argument against it. Yeah, but if, the, if it's a wrong call, it's a wrong call. I want the calls to be right. I have always felt and that I have way. No, and frankly, Paul, I, I think if then if you get your third one and the third one's right, I think you should get a fourth one. I have no problem with that either. If you keep getting them right and they keep messing up calls, why should you be punished and not be able to challenge anymore? Bob Papa said the same thing on NFL radio this yeah. morning. If you keep getting them right, you should keep getting the challenge back. And and I get that. And I, I actually, in concept, have no issue with that at all. But the naysayers will say, well, again, too many challenges, too many replay reviews is boring. It extends the game. These replay reviews so many times will take two and a half minutes when they're only supposed to be like 90 seconds. You you get the drift. The league does not want to slow down the tempo and the flow of the game too much. So they don't want to go hog wild nuts with giving you as many replay reviews as, as you've earned. So they have found the happy medium and said, okay, well, you know what? We, we get the fact that two is kind of restrictive strategically to the coaches. We'll give you a third if you've earned it. I think that's a fair compromise, although I'm with you. What's fair is fair. Let's get all the calls right. If we can get them right and we can fix them, fix them. I, I prefer that. I just don't think that that's ever going to happen because of this, this concept that it slows down the game. All right, we're going to try to get Justin Spears up here in a second. Pearson's made a couple calls. I'm going to text him too, Pearson. I'll let him know that, uh, that we're uh, giving him a call here. So, you know, Paul, just a couple other things I want to talk about. Um, I love the kickoff rule. I, I can't tell you how excited I am about it. I think mm -hmm. it's a good change. You get the play back in the game. It's an exciting play. You have another chance to get one of these guys that are explosive with the ball in their hands with the ball on the field. I think it's exciting. I love it, and I can't wait to see it in action and how these teams adjust how their coverage teams work. And more importantly, I want to see the type of returner they use in the situations. Is it more of a receiver punt returner type? Mm -hmm. Is it more of a running back type? I know Eric Galco, who was with the XFL, he was tweeting about this yesterday. I saw it. And he says it's more of a running back position, he thinks, mm -hmm. now, and you can run real plays out of it, like zone plays or power plays. So I think it's really interesting um, how special teams coaches now will go in the lab over the next few months and try to figure out how to best take advantage of the opportunities to get more big plays. Well, I think you're talking about more speed on special teams. You're talking about more athletic guys, which means more tight ends, more running backs, more maybe strong safeties. Those kinds of guys, even more so now, to become very, very critical in, in trying to make these plays. Uh, I did go to the XFL games. You know, Kevin Gilbride works with us on our college games. And so I went to the Guardians games here at MetLife Stadium. So, you know, I was in person there, not just watching it on TV. And you know what? I was like, Kevin, this is weird. He goes, I know, it's very weird. But I'm like, I could get the hang of this. I, I think if, if this is, can be proven to be safer for the players, who would argue against safety, right? Safety is always a good thing. But if it still allows them to keep it in the game, hey, that's wonderful. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, this one-year experiment, remember, it's going to be voted on again next year, John. Mm -hmm. This is not installed. It's only an experiment. Hopefully, it produces the desired results of cutting back on injuries and still allowing some big returns. I think that would be wonderful. They're expecting, I did just text him, Pearson, by the way. I'm expe They're expecting an 80% return rate on this play, which would be great. It would be marvelous. And, you know. Uh, now, I do wish that we would have known this before free agency. I Joe think he could have went out that. there yeah. and found guys that would be good at this specifically. 
And it was pretty funny how Cordero Patterson got signed like a second after mm-hmm. this rule got put in. All right, Patterson, you're in. Because he's a valuable player in this type of role. Phenomenal kickoff return specialist. Has been his whole career. One of the most devastating kickoff return specialists that the league has ever seen, actually. Uh, could you imagine what Devin Hester would have been doing these days if he was still active? Get it. <laughs> you know? I mean, How about and, Deion and, Sanders? And just in the division now, I'm trying to think. I mean, could the Eagles put Saquon back there for this type of play? Well, he returned kicks at Penn State. Dallas has Cavante Turpin, who is extremely mm-hmm. dangerous as a returner. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think if Washington has a specific returner. They they don't have Curtis Samuel anymore. He, I think, would have been a guy that was per- that would be perfect for this. Well, you know. So, who do you think would be the Giants' returner in this situation? That's a good question. Wow. <sighs> Call him back. We know that Os- Oshevsky, in all likelihood, will still be the punt returner. I-, I think if there's a way for Isaiah McKenzie to make this 53, and we know they just signed him a week or two ago. If there's a way to keep him on the 53, that would be the way to do it. Now, I don't know if there's enough room in the receiver room for him. Remember, uh, last year, when they were trying to chop down that receiver room, it got real sticky as to who was going to make it and who was not, and they wound up getting rid of a legitimate return guy. How about Hyatt or Wandell? Wandell would be a possibility, I think. I know tracking punts has not been the best for him, but could he do kickoff? Well, remember, McKenzie was Wondell Robinson right. when when these guys were in Buffalo. Yep. That that was what they drafted Robinson to be. He was drafted to be the Giants version of Isaiah McKenzie. So yeah, I absolutely think he could be he could be a possibility. And then I'll just say very quickly and we'll and we'll get to Justin Spears here in, in just a second. I worry about how that hip drop tackle rule is going to be legislated. I think it's going to be tough to see in real time. My guess is that they're going to throw flags only on the most egregious, obvious ones. Mm -hmm. And then ones that aren't so egregious, but they catch, they'll just throw out fines on Monday. And that's kind of how they're going to handle it. And I think it is a dangerous play. We've seen guys get rolled up on that a lot. I think there are ways to tackle without doing that. Um, I think the players will adjust a lot better uh, than some people believe who think tackling is going to take a huge hit. It's going to be impossible to tackle without it. I don't buy that. I think players will adjust, and I think they'll figure out a way to tackle just fine, to be honest with you. I suspect that it'll all work out in the end. By the way, uh, Jamison Crowder is still under contract Uh, to Washington. That's a good one. He was the real return guy the Giants cut last year, and he is still on Washington's roster for a second year in a row. So there's, there's your bet there. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. All right, now let's welcome in our, in our guest today. He is Justin Spears. He covers Arizona football for the Tucson Star and the Wildcaster. Also, Spears and Ali, 7 to 9 a.m. on ESPN Radio. Mm-hmm. Justin, you got John Schmelk and Paul Dettino here in beautiful East Rutherford, New Jersey. Hope you're doing well today, man. We appreciate you getting up early for us. Hey, good morning, guys. Anytime. Glad to be a part of the show. All right, so let, let's start with Jordan, Jordan Morgan here, uh, Justin, because I think he obviously is, is the top player coming out of Arizona this year. And I guess I'll start here. He played tackle for Arizona. His arm length came in under 33 inches, which is usually a telltale sign for a guy that people might want to move into guard, but I think he has the athleticism for sure to play tackle. Your thoughts on that whole discussion as someone that watched him play at Arizona for all those years? Yeah, he only played one position, and that's tackle. I mean, he's been a starting tackle for four years at Arizona. He's only played tackle. That's the only position that he knows. And, you know, when you look at the progress that he's made over a four-year span, he has emerged as not only one of the top tackles in the Pac-12, but one of the top tackles in college football. Um, and he didn't allow really any sacks in the last couple of years. Uh, a big part of his development was uh, former Arizona offensive line coach Brennan Carroll, who is the son of NFL coaching legend Pete Carroll. And uh, the Brennan Carroll did a great job of working with Jordan. And over the last couple of years, um, you saw Jordan uh, really hold his own against some of the best defensive linemen in college football. You know, did he have his moments? Sure, right? You know, when I think about this past season, um, some of his worst moments um, as an offensive lineman happened against UCLA's Leatu Latu, who 
who's going to be a first round pick in this <laughs> right. year's yeah. NFL draft, right? So, but but he also won a lot of battles against Leatu Watson. So even though he had his his hiccups from the first game all the way to the last game, he was Arizona's best offensive lineman, and you know he was you know a, a potential first round pick last year or a guy who's going to get taken very high. But you know he suffered an ACL injury in that UCLA game in November 2022 and took his time, missed all of spring ball, missed part of preseason training camp, but came back just ready to go and was 100% all the way through this season and was a great tackle. You look at his pro football focus grades, uh, we're talking about him being, you know, top 10 among tackles, you know, with a you know, certain amount of snaps played. So he's as good as it gets when it comes to playing the tackle position. I don't buy into the whole arm length conversation because, you know, you look at a guy like Rashawn Slater, uh, the left tackle for the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, his arm length isn't, you know, as good as it should be when you compare it to other tackles in the league. But even though Rashawn Slater is a young offensive lineman, he's still really good at the position. So you, know, you, you want to, you're, you're so curious about the arm length, turn on the tape and look at Jordan Morgan. I mean, he's as yep. good as it gets when it comes to tackles. His agility and athleticism is obviously one of the premier things that people are going to look at for him. And by the way, their arm length, him and Slate, are just an eighth of an inch apart. So I think it's a very good point, Justin. But but yeah. I think when I when I saw the numbers for checking in at the combine at six five three eleven, the three eleven for that frame is a little bit concerning to me. I would like to see him add ten fifteen pounds. Who knows? Maybe even twenty. Uh, does it does it seem like for you he could add some bulk and some thickness to his frame, or do you think that's going to hurt his athleticism and agility, which has been really his primary character trait? Sure, I think you know he could always put on a little bit of weight, but you also have to remember where he came from when he was first recruited to Arizona. Um, he was about two hundred and sixty pounds, uh, you know, somewhere between two fifty and two sixty. Uh, so he was a very light prospect when he came to Arizona. And then over time, I mean, he added a pretty significant amount of weight. And even though he added that weight, he never lost his athleticism. So I think, you know, as mm-hmm. Jordan continues to evolve as an NFL player, even if he adds on an extra 10 to 15 pounds, um, I still think he's going to be that super athletic uh, offensive tackle that I know he can be. He's great in pass protection. Uh, when it comes to the, those one-on-one battles with defensive ends or even outside linebackers, um, he's as good as it gets. I think the the big thing that Jordan, you know, wants to work on is probably his run blocking and getting downfield. But you know, he also excelled in that in this past season. So uh, he's a work in progress. Uh, I think if this was any other NFL draft class, I think Jordan Morgan would seriously be one of the first tackles off the board. But because mm-hmm. this draft is so loaded with offensive linemen, we're talking about him being a late first-rounder, maybe even an early second-rounder. No, I buy that, Justin, 100%. I'm with you. If a team did decide to move him into guard in this theoretical world we're living in, at that size, do you? Th- and you mentioned his, his run game trying to be something he's improving on. Is he someone that you think would excel in, at guard, trying to you know do double teams, move defensive tackles off their mark? Or do you think that's something that would be a big adjustment for him and he would have to put on a little bit more weight and more strength in order to be effective as a guy that would you know play more guard? Yeah, I think he could potentially be effective at the guard position if a team does, in fact, move him inside because – you know, his athleticism and his ability to get out to the second level, you know, you add a pulling guard like him into your lineup, um, he's going to do some damage. But he's played tackle his entire high school career, his entire collegiate career, and I don't care, you know, who you are, that's a pretty big adjustment. Even if you're a fantastic offensive lineman, you know, moving positions when you've only known, you know, one position your whole life, uh, that's going to be a very big adjustment, especially – at the NFL level. I think he's capable of making the adjustment. Of course, there's going to be some growing pains because, you know, he's going to be an NFL rookie. He's getting used to the NFL speed and the strength of other guys. Uh, but I, I think over time you could see Jordan evolve into a great guard. But, you know, talking with Jordan and talking you know, with some people connected to Jordan, he doesn't want to play guard. Yep. Um, he's always he's open to you know playing guard if teams view him as that. But he sees himself as a tackle. 
and he wants to play tackle at that Don't next Don't they level. all? Come on. No, it's funny, Justin. I, 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 <laughs> Don't I, they all? I had a chance to talk to Jordan and Mobile at the Senior Bowl, and he had zero interest in asking, answering any questions about playing guard. And, yeah. and I'm like, so are, are you going to do any multi-positional stuff here? And I was asking him if he was going to do a little bit of right tackle stuff in addition to left tackle. He immediately goes, I'm not playing guard here. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I meant right tackle. <laughs> it was very funny. I think he understands the contract status in the NFL. That's yes, what I, I think. think he does. I'll tell you what, guards, start, guards made some bank this year, man. They Robert are. Hunt made $20 million. Yeah. It's they not are. bad. They are. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you look at some teams late in that first round, um, they're looking for tackles. You know, I really – I know you guys are, you know, talking about the Giants here. Don't mean to bring up the, the, the divisional rival, but uh, – Dallas, Dallas Cowboys, Cowboys, man. You hit it. Are losing Tyron Smith. Yep. He'd be perfect there. Yep. Uh, you got a tight end, uh, Tanner McClatchlin, I believe is how he says it. He uh, he looks like at 6'5", 244, he'd be the prototype, right? The thing about it is, though, even with that size and that frame, he's more of a receiving tight end and doesn't really have a lot of the blocking stuff on tape, at least the clips that I looked at. That concerns me a bit. But we know the Giants have Darren Waller, who may retire, which means they could use a receiving tight end. So maybe this is a guy they might want to look at. What what could you tell us about what you've seen with him? Yeah, Tanner McLaughlin, uh, he is a great story. Uh, he was a, a walk-on back in the day at Southern Utah, and uh, eventually uh, he tore his ACL. And he uh, after, I think, his second or third year at Southern Utah, transferred uh, to Arizona. But it was in between his... Uh, rehab. So when he tore his ACL at Southern Utah and in between the spring ball at Arizona, uh, he actually rehabbed his ACL injury by looking at YouTube videos um, and just okay. kind of and, and just did the rehab by himself. He didn't have any medical trainers, didn't have anybody with him to help wow. him because he was in that in-between period. That's very so ambitious. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the kind of guy that you're getting. And he's a very hardworking, ultimate go-getter. And when he first transferred to Arizona, you know, I didn't really make anything of it because they had their their starting tight end come back. And they also added, uh, you know, a four-star tight end who is, you know, the, the highest-rated tight end to join Arizona, says Rob Gronkowski. I'm sure you guys have probably heard of him. Yeah, yeah, and, we heard of him. <laughs> and so we thought that, you know, this, this Tanner McLaughlin guy is probably going to be a third stringer, be a, you know, backup tight end. And all of a sudden he starts just impressing uh, going in, into the, the 2022 season, and he looks so good and was so productive. And then he comes in, wins the starting job, is put on scholarship, and becomes the most productive tight end in Arizona history since Rob Gronkowski. He actually passed Gronk this past season for career receptions by a tight end. So McLaughlin, over the last couple of years, um, he is a he's a great target. He is much like the Travis Kelsey's, the Sam Laporta's of the world. He yeah. is a pass catching tight end. Mm-hmm. Uh, the biggest knock on him is blocking and being able to, you know, hold those defensive ends or even those outside linebackers. So um, he's a work in progress, but man, when you look at the production over the last couple of years, I and mean, you look at everything that he's overcome in that time, uh, any NFL team who drafts him more likely on day three, um, I think they are getting an absolute steal in Tanner McLaughlin. Yeah, and I want to just follow up real quick because his testing was phenomenal. A four six one one five eight. You figure a walk on Southern Utah, you're not going to have that type of testing. So I almost think there's there's still a bunch more to bite off the apple here as he gets more experience and becomes a better player in the league, especially given his attitude. You've talked about. Yes, and his hard work and his determination, and also how humble he is too. When you know when you guys talk to him, there's never any arrogance about him. And, you know, a huge shout-out to him because, you know, the players were requested after Arizona's Pro Day to speak with media. And out of all the guys who are likely to get drafted, McLaughlin was the only one who opted to speak with us afterwards. Um, I think that really says um, a lot about him, and um, he will go down as an all-time Arizona tight end. But, yeah, you guys are absolutely right. Um, the The raw potential that he has, uh, there's still so much left, and uh, wh- whoever drafts him, uh, they're going to get an absolute great tight end, and, and uh, maybe a guy who ends up becoming one of the best at the position here in the next few years. 
Wow. I think it's interesting, first of all, that he came from Alberta, Canada, and then the way he spells his last name certainly doesn't look like McLaughlin, but that's for another day. My question, if he was in the room with me, after everything that you've just said about how ambitious he is, how humble, humble he is, the work ethic he has, and then looking at his frame, and he's cut out of stone. He has one heck of a body type. Why yeah. is he not a better blocker? Is that because he doesn't want to be? Does he not have the intestinal, uh, you know, watts to become one of those guys who can, uh, you know, mix it up with a guy coming off the edge? Because my goodness, with everything you've said, that should be a box that's checked. Sure. Well, I also think that it was just the, the system that Arizona ran. And that's with fair. Other jet fish. That's fair. Uh, there were multiple tight ends used, and when he was, you know, often in the game. Um, he was flexed out like a Travis Kelsey or George Kittle type of wide receiver or, or tight end. Um, and then whenever, you know, they wanted to go 12 personnel or, you know, add in another uh, blocking tight end, which they normally did, they would bring in their other guy whose name is Roberto Miranda. And he was more of like the run blocking tight end. So they had multiple uh, body types, uh, multiple types of uh, tight ends that came in and were very effective for Arizona. But, you know, Tanner McLaughlin told us at the start of last year, and he said it, you know, periodically over the course of the season, that you know, the one thing that he's really been honing in on is his ability to, to block. And I think that he showed a little bit of that this year, but it's still, you know, a work in progress. And as you guys know, uh, blocking at the NFL level is so, so challenging. So he's got his work cut out for him for sure. All right, I'm going to jump over to the running back position, Michael Wiley. I had a chance to watch him at one of the All Star games. And I was impressed with him as a receiver, and I think he brings a little bit of juice from the running back position. Give us your uh, little thumbnail on what Wiley will bring to the field if a team drafts him at running back on day three. Well, Michael Wiley is a do-it-all guy, and he was the, the leader of an Arizona running back room that had uh, four really good running backs. But he is one of my favorite players in Arizona football history because you know he came in during a time – when Kevin Sumlin was the head coach of the Wildcats. And I don't know if you guys know about Kevin Sumlin in that era at Arizona, but Kevin Sumlin's kind of like a pariah now. Like, he, he drove the program into the ground, and, I mean, it completely became nightmarish for Arizona football. But Michael Wiley, he never left. He never turned his back. He never went into the, the transfer portal. He never declared for the NFL draft when he had every opportunity to. He stayed committed to his time at Arizona. And over five years, um, he became one of the top running backs in program history, especially through the passing game. Uh, he has the most receiving yards by any Arizona running back in program history. Uh, this past year, he pan uh, passed Vance Johnson, who ended up having a really great career for the Denver Broncos in the 1990s. And Michael Wiley became that guy. It was so effective in the passing game. And I'll never forget, there was one game, I think it might have been the Oregon State game of this year, where Michael Wiley was pretty quiet for the most part. In Arizona, they were in a very tight game against Oregon State. But guess who had two critical fourth-quarter uh, touchdown catches? It was Michael Wiley. And not just, you know, catching in the end zone and that's bad. No, I'm talking about getting the ball on the sideline, tiptoeing, dancing around defenders, juking guys. Uh, when he gets out into space, he's a very – very effective uh, running back. So him as a, as a pass catcher uh, in today's NFL, I mean, he's going to be just fine, but he can also run between the tackles too, and he is super tough. And like I said, the adversity factor, uh, being able to stay locked in, and no matter what is thrown your way, um, you're able to overcome it and, and be productive. Um, I think it says a lot about Michael Wiley. When you look at his time at Arizona and how he's grown as a person and as a football player, um, I think a lot of teams are going to pay attention to that and be appreciative of having a running back like that on their team. Final one for me, Jacob Cowing, who ran a sub 4-4 four four at the Combine, little short receiver uh, with quickness. Uh, we were just talking about special teams and the new rules on kickoffs this year, which are going to make these kinds of guys maybe more valuable. Some thoughts on his progress as he tries to get into the pros? Yeah, he understands that. Special teams is going to be a big reason why he stays on an NFL roster. That's why he took the gunner position on Arizona's punt Smart coverage. move. Um, he also took uh, the, the punt returner roles, but very underwhelming numbers when it comes to punt returning. Uh, that game, going back to the Oregon State game, 
Um, leading up to Michael Wiley's touchdown, Jacob Cowling had two very impressive punt returns that set up Arizona uh, inside Oregon State territory. Uh, but outside of that game, not really effective as a punt returner. Um, we'd love to see you know him uh, become more of, of that kind of guy at the at the National Football League level. But you know, as a slot receiver, um, you get that ball into his hands, and when he gets out into open space and he's able to to slash and cut and, and get upfield. Um, he's very fun to watch. And you, you know, the numbers speak for itself. The man has the seventh most receiving yards by any college football wide receiver between his time at UTEP and his time at Arizona. So statistically, one of the best to ever play in college football. And his only knock right now is he is, what, 5'10", 160 pounds. Like, he is, he's a smaller guy. Mm-hmm. And if he didn't, if he wasn't so light and if he was a little bit taller, I mean, he would be, a day one or a day two guy, but wherever he lands on day three, if he gets called, um, I think the NFL, whatever NFL team is getting a really good receiver. Justin, tell the folks uh, where they can find you and your great work. Uh, yeah, you can find my coverage on Arizona football and the NFL draft on Tucson.com. And uh, we're also talking about all of it on Spears and Ali on ESPN Tucson. I appreciate you guys for having me on. Justin, great stuff, man. Thank we you. appreciate the time and let's talk again soon. All right. Anytime guys. Appreciate it. Justin Spears, great job talking about Arizona football and some of the players coming out there. Paul, fun show today. Your overall thoughts on what we learned about the Arizona and Ohio State prospects coming out in this year's draft. Well, again, John, we're talking about teams that that are going to send a half a dozen picks into the NFL. Okay, Ohio State even more, you know, and even more next year, of course, like we already talked about with Bill. Bottom line is... These guys are becoming more and more pro-ready as they get into the ranks. And and my biggest question for any of these guys is what is their maturity level and how quickly are they going to be able to produce? Because coaches today don't have four and five years anymore. They have two or three years to turn things around. So they rush these guys into the lineup and onto the field to play a lot faster than they used to. Well, you also want to take advantage of the rookie contract, which no is doubt. a big part of this, Well, too. it's economic, too. Mm-hmm. So so my biggest concern with, with all of these programs that have a slew of guys that are going into the draft and are going to get taken – is going to be how quickly are they going to adjust. It's not about any one of these players in particular. It's just in general, and it's for this entire class because a lot of these rookies are going to see time right away, not just with the Giants, but around the league. And the maturity, and we talked about this at the Combine, it's a much more mature class than it's been in years past. Will they be mature enough to handle the transition as quickly as possible? That's really a, just, just a generic observation I would have with anybody. Yeah, I'm with you. I think Jordan Morgan is an interesting one, Paul. He's a guy, and I'm going to redo my – or re-review. I've already done a lot of the offensive tackle tape, but a lot of it is from the first half of the year. I'm going to watch like the last mm-hmm. few games and catch up and put my final rankings and grades on him and everything. And I did watch Jordan Morgan at the Senior Bowl close up. And he did a good job blocking, but there were, especially in the team portions of some of these drills, where guys did get into his chest with their length. And I saw him get long-armed, and he got put backwards a little bit. We did not see that with Rashawn Slater when he came out that year. No. That was not an issue for him. So it was not. Morgan has the athleticism and the foot speed and the coordination to be an offensive tackle. He checks all those boxes. And the arm length wouldn't bother me if I didn't see it impact him. But I did see it impact him at times at the Senior Bowl. So I'm looking forward to getting back uh, onto the last couple months of his tape to see if I see that at all during some of the game stuff. Thoughts about him. First of all, you're right. There will be some organizations that will just say automatically, arm length, no good. He's not playing tackle for us. So then they're going to say, is he draftable as a guard? That's a problem for me. He's a guy who's going to have to do a lot of pulling to use that athleticism to get to the outside to get on the edge. And like outside have to. and outside zone stuff. He has He's to. not a guy going to want to want to run a lot of duo and man no. and power forget stuff. Forget power. With. Forget mm-hmm. it. Forget it. At 311, forget it. All right, he's going to have to be 325, 330 to even have a chance to move anybody off the line. I know he added a lot of weight since he got to the program, but that may mean he's maxed out. That may mean he can't add any more weight. He might be at his max. That's going to be a concern as I try to project him if he's going to be an NFL guard. 
That would be my thoughts on him specifically. Aside from Morgan and Harrison, who is the one prospect we talked about today that has you most excited? I really got hard on the Arizona tight end, McLaughlin, because he looks the part, and I want to know that he's got that blocking fire in his belly. And after listening to our expert, I believe he wants to do it. I think it's there. Now he's going to have to show it once he gets to an NFL team. But if he does, he could be a very good player for somebody. Hey, we've learned with tight ends, Paul. You bet on the traits, right? You bet on the size, the him. speed, and he checks he's all the boxes, and he tested well. So he's got he him. has all that. He, he to mention you broke Rob Gronkowski's uh, receiving tight end records at Arizona. He had forty five catches last year. I think he's an interesting, and he's going to be. He's not a day two pick. He's going to be a day three pick. Yeah, you know, can you figure out a way uh, to turn those tools into a more well rounded and impactful player if you get him on day three of the draft? I think he's. A, I think he's a very interesting player. I totally concur with that. Very interesting. All right, I think we hit on most of the Rossi Rossi parts. So we got a weekend ahead of us. We are now under a month until the NFL draft. Uh, your final thoughts here as we move ahead. Well, you know, John, to be honest with you, um, the one thing that I'm disappointed about after coming out of the NFL meetings is that they did not outlaw the tush push. That did not get a lot of play in Orlando. Well, do you know why, Paul? It wasn't that effective this year. I understand, but my point is if safety is first. Yeah, but it's not a dangerous play. I think it is. Why? The Giants had two guys hurt on it. Well, one was the the one to Bellinger I had understand. nothing to do with it being a touch push. I, I, I understand that. But for me, when you have a massive amount of bodies uh, in that one small confined area and they're just shoving against each yeah, other. The same thing as a quarterback sneak. I, I, I understand. Uh, but now you're getting the impetus from both sides. Quarterback sneak, you're not. It's just the quarterback with his own force against that wall. When you take that other side of the equation and you're pushing on the quarterback's back, now you've got two forces of pressure. I think it's a bad move. I think it's a safety hazard. I know a lot of players who believe me and agree with it 100%. But they they have the injury rates on these plays, and it doesn't show that. I don't like the play. I think it's, it's a just dangerous... because the Eagles are good at it. That's why you don't I like the play. Let's be honest for a play. second. No, <laughs> there's players in this locker room who think it should be outlawed too, who think it's dangerous and don't want to run it. I'm telling you that right now. I'm not going to name names, but they don't want to run it. Okay. I I think that there should have been more consideration to getting it out of the game. That's my take on the the, the meetings. Well, if they week. had data that it was dangerous, I think they would have considered it. But the, but but the data is not there. I don't have the data, so I don't know. I honestly, I don't well, know. I mean, I mean, the, the I league has said that there's no data to indicate that injuries are more likely on a tush push than any other play. Of course, of course it's only been now primarily used two years, two years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that, it's also the only team that's really good at it. Well, not the only team, but if you take the Eagles out of it, the percent success of regular sneaks versus tush push is basically the same. Uh, and again, that's not my right. My point. I got you. I got you. My I got point you, I got you. is, I just think physics say if you're going to have pushing from both sides of the quarterback, his front and his back, as you put him into the middle of that massive pile, common sense and logic says to me that's not a good situation. That's that's all I'm saying. No, fair enough. All right, everybody, we're sprinting to the draft now. It's coming fast. It's coming furious. Uh, we only have three weeks, three full weeks worth of shows. Uh, on the Giants Huddle Podcast and Big Blue Kickoff Live. And then we have the short three days before the NFL Draft on April 24th. (laughs) So it's coming fast and furious. Make sure you stay tuned to all of our content. We'll have a lot of stuff coming out. Uh, We're going to have at least three huddles next week, maybe a fourth, and we're going to have the accelerated version going on. We'll have mock drafts, draft season, you name it. Stay tuned to all of our content. You know, we really get deep into the stuff. Uh, if you have questions, send them in on Twitter. We're happy to answer them. I'll try to get into the uh, Big Blue Kickoff at gmail.com email address. Make sure you send in your questions to that as well, and we'll hit all of them as we move along here on all of our content right here on the Giants Podcast Network. For Paul Dottino, I'm John Schmelk. Uh, Happy holidays for those of you celebrating Easter this weekend. Uh, We are off tomorrow. There's no Big Blue Kickoff Live on Friday. We'll be back on Monday, and we'll talk to you then. Enjoy your long weekend, and then we sprint to the draft. See you then. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile, and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, offering professional grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. 
Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. If you're a smoker or dipper looking to make a change, you really only need one reason to do it. But with Zen nicotine pouches, you can find many. Zen is America's number one nicotine pouch. It's made with only six simple ingredients. Plus, Zen is the only nicotine pouch with a 10-day hassle-free trial. There are lots of options when it comes to nicotine satisfaction, but there's only one Zen. Find your Zen online or in a store near you at zen.com find. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical.